Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about this subject. What's the point? Everybody say, what's the point? What is the point? Uh, when it comes to church, has anybody ever asked themselves this question before as it relates to anything or anything or everything biblically, biblically related? You ever been taught something where you just say, well, what's the point? Show of hands, a couple people. He's like, nope, I got it locked down. Chris Green's my favorite preacher. I'm the future youth president. We're going outside next week. We got it. We're good. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the reason that we gather together, the reason that we congregate, if you will. That's the word that we're going to use. And this is an interesting subject, and tonight's going to be teaching and more practical. But we understand this, that our walk with God is an individual walk. And so our relationship with God is individual. It's in our prayer closet. It's in the secret place. Yet, we have this connection where we do still all gather together to worship and to pray. And so if our walk with God is an individual walk, then what is the point of going to church? And so this looks at the reason. We're going to talk about the reason why we gather together just like we are tonight. And so a couple stats for you. Uh, less than 20% of Americans today regularly attend church. American church attendance is steadily declining, and it has been for the last while. Established churches, not just new churches that have started up and are starting from you know, grassroots and trying to build something up, but churches that have been around for 40, 50, 60 years, uh, they're beginning to decline. The number of churches that are opening or are being started are not enough to meet uh, the growth that is happening in the population. And so at the current pace today, uh, by 2050, they are saying that church attendance will be half of what it was in 1990. This is true despite the fact that roughly 70 to 75 percent of North Americans say that they're Christian, but less than one out of five attend church on any given Sunday. So it tells us and shows us that we live in a culture that believes that you can be a Christian without attending church. Many churches are trying traditional means of attracting visitors like mailers, putting stuff in the mail, door hangers, and personal invitations. Some churches, they host block parties or they do special events, just like we do to try and get people that are not from the local church to come to a local church in a very uh, friendly and inviting way. Many churches meet with marketing experts to try and create brand awareness of their church, Uh, and we can probably think of other methods that we've seen of how we try to reach out, how the local church tries to reach out to those that don't come. And so there is obviously nothing wrong with with trying any of these methods. Anything that we can do to try and bring people to church is a good thing. But we must ask ourselves these questions. Number one, why is the decline of church attendance happening? And does it really matter? Because if this is an individual walk, how important is that in comparison to getting together? So the question has to be asked, well, why as Christians, if we're trying to live for God, why would we not attend church? What? Amen. Why would we not attend church? The church in the book of Acts was, a very different, was very different from the average church today. Because in the book of Acts, that church, they saw signs and wonders and miracles regularly. They had prayer meetings where the entire building would shake. They gave freely to each other and helped meet the needs of other people that were in the church. So they would literally give of their finances. They would give of their resources, their food, whatever they had to help somebody else in the church that might have been struggling. They established friendships that reached outside the church walls, and they connected uh, people with a life-changing experience. Now, today, many, ch- uh, many churches do not teach or preach about the Holy Ghost. Aren't you glad that you're a part of a church that still believes that God fills people with the Holy Ghost? But if you have grown up in this church, that means you probably haven't gone to many other churches or many other denominations. But here's the truth. Many churches actually don't teach or preach about the Holy Ghost, and therefore, they don't talk about the power, that the ability that it gives us through the Spirit with it. And so, with no Holy Ghost, with no power that comes along with it, As a result, this creates church where people don't want to attend church because they feel like they aren't any better for having going, meaning they go to church and they say, well, I I feel the same way. Uh, It didn't really seem to impact me. I didn't really care for what I felt. It just felt like I was home doing nothing. It didn't feel any different. There was nothing from the service that connected with me because there was no move of the Spirit. And so they would say, well, 
if it's no different than just being home or watching online or, or not going at all, if I feel the same, if there's nothing different that is happening there, if God's Spirit isn't moving, then why would I go? And so we, we must desire that when people come and visit our church or our youth group, that they experience the power of God because that is what makes people want to come back. When somebody comes to church and they say, you know what, there's something different that I feel. When you guys pray, when you worship, when that person began to sing that song, when the word was preached, I just felt something in the room change. Anybody ever heard somebody say something like that before? Maybe you have felt that for yourself. That is only through the Holy Ghost that people have that kind of experience. Coming to church just to raise our hands a little bit, clap a little bit, uh, pray a little bit, hear a nice message, come to the altar for five minutes and then leave, the impact of that is so small compared to when the Spirit of God begins to move. And so there must be a dynamic part of our services that when we gather together, when we all leave, when a visitor comes for the first time, they don't leave saying, oh, that was nice but that they would say, man, there was something different about what I felt in that room. That is the thing that changes lives, and that is what's going to make people want to come back. And so there are many reasons to attend church. So does church attendance matter? Look at your neighbor say, does church attendance matter? To answer that question, we've got to turn to the Word of God and understand what it says. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 10, if you've got your Bible with me, starting in verse 19 and reading down to verse 25. And we're going to come back through these a little bit in different sections in just a moment. But here's what it says in the New Living Translation. And so, dear brothers and, brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain in the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep us promised. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And here's the big one. You've probably heard this verse before. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of Jesus returning is drawing near. This is a verse that we use when we talk about the reason that we gather together just like we did tonight, that we should not neglect, we shouldn't go away from our meeting together, but as a matter of fact, the Bible says we should do it even more often as we know that Jesus is closer to returning. But when we come to church, there are many different reasons that, that we do come to church. Uh, number one, we hear the preaching of the Word of God at church, which is what causes sinners to believe. Romans chapter 10, verse 14, it says, How can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Jesus if they've never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Jesus unless somebody tells them about it? And so coming to church, gathering together, gives people the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus. Jesus promised that if we gather together to worship, that he will visit us. This is Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. He said, for where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am there among them. The writer of Hebrews, he tells us that we should get closer, or we should, as the second coming of Jesus gets closer, that we should be gathering together more. And so if we are to truly be an apostolic church walking in the example of the apostles, we'll find that church attendance is very important to our walk with God. Those early believers in the book of Acts, they uh, met in the temple daily, and so surely we can try to commit to at least coming to church on Sunday and Wednesday. The Bible gives us this instruction that we should gather together. Look at your neighbor and say, you should be here. Now, we don't say this in a convicting way so that if you miss a church service, you feel this, this unending guilt. Listen, life happens. Sometimes you've got to work. Sometimes you're on vacation. Sometimes you get sick. Whatever the case may be, but any time that we are able to and the church doors are open, we should put our best foot forward to be here. And everybody said, amen. Now, there are three reasons that we really attend church if we want to boil it down uh, to three simple things. Number one, we attend to interact and entertain the Spirit of God. We attend for the sake of unity, gathering together and connecting together with each other. And we also gather for the sake of accountability. Everybody say accountability. Now, when it comes to entertaining the presence of God, feeling God's Spirit move in a service, uh, we understand it as we just read in Hebrews chapter 10. 
verses 19 to 22, that we enter the holy place. We can step into the presence of God through the blood of Jesus. In the Old Testament, the Israelites worshiped in the tabernacle. So the tabernacle had three parts. It had the outer court, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. And so people, they could bring in their sacrifices to the outer court, but that was as far as they were allowed to go. Even the high priest uh, could not enter the Holy of Holies any time that he chose to. He could only go in once a year. And so there was one person once a year that could actually go into the presence of God. In the tabernacle, one man once a year could enter in and feel or experience or entertain the presence of the Lord. And so God, he wasn't pleased with this veil of separation between us and him. And so Jesus, he died on the cross to give us access to his spirit. It is because of the crucifixion, it is because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus that we can enter into the holy place, that we can experience and be filled with God's Holy Spirit. That's why when Jesus was crucified on the cross, we see the veil in the temple, it was torn in two. This is symbolic that God's presence isn't just behind a veil anymore. So Jesus, he he dies on the cross and he gives us access to his spirit. And now we can all interact and entertain the presence of the Lord anytime that we choose to. And so, while we should entertain God's spirit in our private devotion, everybody say private devotion, we need to be praying people, we need to be fasting people, and we need to read and hear from God's word for ourselves, not just gathering together. This isn't a service that we come to in the middle of the week to get topped up, to get us to Sunday so that we can come back on Sunday to get us through Wednesday, but we need to be praying and we need to be reading the Word of God and and hearing God's voice in our personal lives. We need to do that, but it's still necessary that we gather together. We understand that the the day of Pentecost, when it happened, it happened because the disciples were gathered together and praying. We understand that prison doors flew open when Paul and Silas worshipped together. The lame man at the gate, beautiful, he received his healing when Peter and John walked together. Everybody say together. To the house of the Lord. And Jesus promised at any time that two or three gather together in his name that he would be present. And so it's important that we gather. Look at your neighbor and say, it's important that we gather. That's entertaining the presence of the Lord. Number two. Unity in in the faith, that we are united together. We've talked about this a little bit a few months ago, uh, this word koinonia or fellowship. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, to go back a couple verses, it says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Together, everybody say together. Together, we hold fast to the hope that is found in Jesus. Our need for Jesus brings us together. That's the reason that we are all here tonight. We desire to live a life that that worships the Lord. And so we gather together, we worship, and we pray, and we hear the word of God together. We are joined together because of this unity that we are in search of Christ and doing our best to live for him. Uh, Many times in the New Testament, the apostles urged the church to unite together as well. 1 Peter Chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, and love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender hearted, and keep a humble attitude. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony. Everybody say harmony. To live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and in purpose. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 to 3, it says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble, always be gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Look at your neighbor and say, you're faulty. Look at your other neighbor and yell it. Say, you're faulty. There you go. We're all broken. We're all messed up. None of us are perfect. And so the word tells us, you know what? Listen, be humble and gentle and be patient with each other because none of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. But make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it says, all the believers... Were united in heart and in mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything that they had. 
everything that those people in the book of Acts had, Acts chapter 4, it tells us that whatever they had, they felt like it belonged to somebody else. It wasn't just their own, but it was for them to share. And so we have all of these commands and these, uh, these verses that tell us that we must be united. And the way that we are united is by gathering together. That doesn't mean that when you come on Wednesday night that you have to be everybody's best friend. That's not how it works. You don't have to be friends with everybody that sits in your row or sits in your section or, or comes to your youth group or goes to the altar. Uh, that would be really hard to maintain that many friendships. But you simply have to come together having the same mindset, and that is that we desire to serve the Lord. Everybody shout unity. Everybody shout accountability. This is a good one. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. It says, let us... Think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not, not neglect our meeting together, some people do, but encourage one another. Somebody say, encourage one another. We are called to encourage one another, to motivate or to push each other forward. We must battle a sinful culture on a daily basis. Every day that we get up, we are fighting, we are warring in the spirit to try and live a holy and separate life. And so while living righteously is a personal battle, it is much easier when you have others around you to keep you accountable. That when you're struggling, that when you're having a hard time, that when it's been a rough week, that you've got friends, that you have people that you go to church with, that you're united with, that can help motivate you, that can help push you forward and encourage you to, hey, you know what? You've got this. You don't have to do that. You don't have to live like that. It's been a bad day. It's been a bad week, a bad month, a bad season. But you know what? You can do this. Look at your neighbor. Say, you can do this. We can keep each other accountable. The Bible it clearly demonstrates that living for God is easier with the support of other believers. Imagine how hard it would be to live for God if every time you came to church, it was like one person, you and one person, and that other person was somebody different every single week. And you felt like you were just on this island all by yourself, you know, trying to live holy, trying to live separate, trying to pray, trying to fast, trying to understand and study the Word of God. It would be a challenge. But that's not the way that it is for us. We gather together with like-minded believers that help and support each other, or at least that's what we are called to do. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9 to 12, it says, uh, notice that, he, that it says, he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world, and the same one who descended is the same one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Psalm chapter 73, verse 2, and then skipping down to verse 17, it says, But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. But then I went into your sanctuary. Then I went to church, O oh God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. The psalmist is saying, you know what? I was struggling. I felt like I was going to fall. I felt like I was going to slip up. But when I got to church, when I gathered together with other people that were walking the same walk that I was, it encouraged me, and I was able to step beyond the struggle that I was walking through in that moment. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens another friend. We must allow ourselves to be accountable for the way that we live. And so if we are straying away from God, other people can be there to pull us back into line, that they can be there to have our back when we are struggling. Hebrews, it tells us in chapter 10, how we are to help each other, that we should stir each other to love and to good works, encouraging one another. It's not the role of fellow believers to straighten each other. It is not, sorry, it is not the role of fellow believers to straighten each other out. Only God can do that, but we can encourage each other to walk righteously. Believers are not to chastise each other, offend each other, accuse each other without proof, shun each other when we mess up or fail, or gossip about each other. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to encourage each other to walk righteously. And so the house of God, 
this service, when we gather in this room, when we come to prayer, when we're in the main sanctuary together, it must be a safe place where people can go to find hope. And if we've experienced God's hope in our lives, we ought to open our arms to anybody else who walks through the church doors. Music, you can join me on the platform tonight. We're just going to be a little bit longer. We must make sure that no matter how busy we get in life, that we make the house of God a priority any time that we can. Everybody say amen. Why don't you stand with me tonight? I know that life can get busy. I know that there is school. I know that there are exams and tests and projects and so many things that are vying for our time. I know that there are just so many things that are pulling us away from attending church. But I want to remind you tonight that coming to church is important. It's important so that we can be accountable to each other. It's important so that we can encourage each other and affirm each other. But it's also a place where we can corporately gather and encounter and experience the presence of God. Coming to church is important. Look at your neighbor say, coming to church is important. We're going to close in prayer tonight, but I would just ask that you would join me at the altar here. We're going to pray one for another and practice what we have talked about in this place tonight. When you get here, would you just join together with somebody? Because you never know what somebody else is walking through. You never know that what the person beside you is thinking, how, how rough their life has been lately. Maybe somebody in this room said, you know what, I just, I just really didn't want to go tonight. I got so much going on, I don't feel good. But they made the sacrifice and they made the effort to be here tonight. But we must make sure that we gather so that we can experience the presence of God together, so that we are united together, but also so that we can encourage and hold each other accountable. Would you pray with me as we close? Jesus, I thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, I know that I am speaking to a group of people who are united, who, who do love each other and who do pull each other up. Lord, I thank you for the direction that we get from your word as it comes to congregating, to gathering together. Lord, we understand that iron sharpens iron so that we can sharpen each other. And Lord, I pray that we would understand that church is a safe place for each and every one of us to gather, that church is a place that we can come to in any season of our life. Lord, where we can be united with brothers and sisters, where we can be encouraged and, and pulled up and pulled back on track when we may be struggling. And Lord, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice tonight, that they would understand the priority of the principle of gathering together in this place. Lord, we desire every time we gather to experience your presence. Lord, we desire every time that we gather that we would be filled and refilled to overflowing with your spirit. And so God, I pray tonight in this place that each and every young person would first and foremost understand the importance of gathering together, understand the importance of interacting and entertaining your presence. Lord, that we would understand the importance of unity and accountability. And I pray that those two things will be prevalent amongst each and every one of us. I thank you for your spirit, Lord, that I feel in this moment. And Lord, I pray tonight that as we close this service, that you would go with us. Lord, that your spirit would give us boldness and that you would create opportunity for us to connect with somebody who is hungry or who is hurting or somebody who is seeking more than what they've ever experienced yet in life. Lord, I pray that you would go with us and bless us all tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight. It's 753, so we were a little bit quick tonight. But that just gives us more time to hang out. Shake hands with a few people or high five them. Uh, we'll put on some music. Feel free to socialize. Step outside and grab some fresh air. God bless you. We will see you this weekend.